Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Alex Garza, and thank you for attending uh, the second reading of my solo play, Macduff. Uh, we did our first reading back in uh, uh, August, and that was done via Zoom uh, due to, of course, some, you know, some challenges and restrictions as we were facing some of the challenges with COVID. Um, and uh, I'm glad that we're able to be here live in the theater and we're also live streaming uh, this reading. So there's some people watching from afar. And those of you watching from afar, thank you for being here. And uh, you should be able to find my email address in the comments section. So after the performance, if you like, you can email me your thoughts and uh, you can also maybe put some questions in the comments section. And I thank you for watching. And those of you who are here, thank you very much. And the goal of this reading is to continue to develop my work and uh, this is a play that I've kind of had in my mind and kind of started writing a long time ago. And it's only this year that I had, you know, really wanted to start to kind of formulate it into a more solid form. And I really thank the Vortex for helping, uh, providing the support to help me develop my work. And the end goal is hopefully next year to eventually do like an actual staged kind of workshop of this play. Um, for today, it's just a reading to kind of give you an idea of the script, the characters, the story, and hopefully, you know, try to do it as much of a performance mode as possible. 
but of course, you know, it's not going to be an actual, you know, up on my feet type stage performance. So, and uh, after the the reading is over, if you want to stick around, I really appreciate any discussion, conversation we can have. Maybe if you have some thoughts about the play and the reading, and uh, just maybe some suggestions or just questions uh, that maybe weren't answered within the reading itself. Again, this is a work in progress, and uh, it's very kind of close to my heart because uh, Macduff is one of the roles that I've been able to play in my kind of career as an actor, one of my favorite roles, and I always wanted to kind of do some kind of solo show based on the character and thinking about where is he now and what would happen if he lived in our times today, 21st century, especially with all the challenges we're facing. Um, so thank you for being here and uh, present to you uh, my one person play, with Duff. Methinks I saw a feather floating from the sky. Hello, feather. Methinks I saw a feather floating by. Please, feather, don't leave me all alone. I marveled with jealousy as the feather slept so peacefully, lifted so tenderly by blankets of air. Without worry, without concern, the feather lightly descended to the ground as I painfully shed a tear. Knowing my life would never experience such a sensation. I would never float on air. I would never know a carefree existence. The knowledge that should I fall into a downward spiral, I would land to the ground, touch the earth safely, free of wounds, free of damage to my mind, my soul, my heart. Oh gosh, is that all he's going to do, talk about feathers? It's a metaphor, people. And frankly, feathers are awesome. My dream to have feathers so that I might safely fly away from the uncertainty of my life was foolish and not in keeping with the wingless perils of being but duff. Oh, to be carried away by the winds to a place of peace, a paradise, armed with wings, wrapped, wrapped in a blanket of love. Methinks I saw a feather floating from the sky. Methinks I saw a feather floating by. Methinks the feather watched as sad Macduff did cry. That was a pretty crappy thing to do, Mr. Feather. My name is Macduff. Well, you heard my name in the song. It's not rocket science, people. <laughs> Look, I only signed up for five minutes, and I promised I wouldn't go longer than that, but I can't help it. I have quite a story to tell, and I apologize if I go on too long, and please, please don't shine that light in my face this time to stop me from speaking. I will tell my story the way that I want, and I will take as long as I want. You're not paying me, after all. You should probably be paying me. <laughs> Macduff's life story. Priceless. His life fair. Man and woman, procreation. We are born into a cruel and unforgiving world. Blah, blah, blah. We are raised and cared for, nurtured until a certain age, and then just let go. Is this just an act? To be spoiled within the nest, only to be pushed out? What if a man is not ready to fly? Mama and Papa, I'm not ready to fly. What if he is cursed with crippled wings? I did not ask to be born. I did not ask for life. I am stranded on this island of pain and misery. And yes, I know we're not actually on an island. It's a metaphor, people. <laughs> my memories are floating within the confinement of my soul. I walk through a figurative, barren desert, my exposed feet burning in the sand. Figuratively, that is. My world, my world is crumbling. Will my heart heal and someday become whole? Will I stop living through the eyes of the bloodlines, cemented to the past? Will I be released and become part of the revolving of the earth? Living through the bloodlines, cemented to the past. Will I let go of these demons? Will I, be, will I break free of these chains? Will I find a new life, a family, and love? Living through the bloodlines, cemented to the past. Do I deserve the liberation of death and perhaps rebirth? To start the cycle once again with the happier ending. 
Living through the bloodlines, cemented to the past. I don't know what that means either. You might as well put that light away. I have a long time to go and I'm not getting off this stage. 2021, the year of Macduff. Celebrate good times, come on! I said that the same thing last year, didn't I? And the year before that, and the year before that. I've been saying it for decades, for centuries, for a millennium. Millennia? I've said it all, I've seen it all, and I can't seem to get my life back on track. My immortal life. Fame, I don't want to live forever. <laughs> Did I forget to tell you I was immortal? How else could I be 1,000 frickin' years old and still be in such incredible shape? Uh, eh. 2021, the year of Macduff. Ha ha ha! Horror! Horror! The castle is filled with horror! My life is filled with such horror! My unending life! And just at that moment when I believe I have a grasp on my life, that I have grappled with the slings and arrows of my sorrow, sorrowful and pathetic existence, well, something else comes along to take a wee-wee all over it. And even though I am immortal, even though I can never die, I must still, tragically, live as a mortal. I possess no magic. No magico! Though magic is in my bloodlines, Living through the bloodline. Stop it! My veins have been denied any sort of supernatural powers. I possess the power to live forever. What good is that? Thanks a lot, Grandma. Oh, I'll get to that. 2021, the year of Macduff. A year where Macduff continues his exile. Centuries and centuries of exile, driven further into exile by the fear of a plague, a virus terrorizing the entire world that began last year and changed the way we live, that changed the way I live. I am immortal, but unfortunately I can still get sick. Did I forget to thank you, my grandmother, oh mystical enchantress whose spell denied me the sweet release of death? but it could not cure the common cold. <laughs> Thank you. Horror! Horror! Horror is a world living behind a mask, living alone in a tiny dwelling, supporting myself by my job at Build-A-Sign. That's what I do. I build signs. It's the Lord's work, truly. Not. <laughs> but I build and build. I build signs all day long, wearing my mask, feeling so lonely to afford the rent for a place to live because even though I am immortal, I must still pay the bills. Once again, muchas gracias, grandmama. Hi. What's your name? Uh, I'm Macduff. Oh, hi, Macduff. I'm Zacharoo. Don't you mean Zachary? No, Zacharoo. It's like Zachary, but with the U at the end. Zacharoo. That doesn't make any sense. Well, blame my parents. So, uh, how do you like working at build sign I don't like it. Well, sorry to hear that. I like it, okay? Building signs? Well, it's God's work. That doesn't make sense. I'm just making conversation. Do you want to hang out after work, Macduff? No. Oh. Okay, I, I just thought I'd ask. Let, let me know if you change your mind, Macduff. I probably won't, Zacharu. Poor Zacharu. Little did he know my pain. Little did he know my history. What a wonderful joy it would have been to connect with someone, someone like Zacharu. But my heart could not endure such a trial. The challenge of opening my heart to another. And was he vaccinated? I don't know. Ah! <laughs> I cannot exist in this world. Horror! Horror! One thousand years ago, my torturous journey began. My voice echoed through the castle. I screamed, what could I do? My king, the ruler of Scotland, was dead, murdered in his sleep. Confusion now hath made his masterpiece, I screamed. 
most sacrilegious murder had broke out the Lord's anointed temple and stole this, the life of the building. I could do nothing but yell for the castle to awake. In an unrelenting frenzy, my voice shouted, Murder and treason! Murder and treason! I was only silenced by the sight of Malcolm, Duncan the king's oldest son, who was my friend and heir to the throne. What a tragic day. What a sad day to look into Malcolm's eyes and inject horror into his soul, to have him arise to a new day, only to be punctured by the news of the king's, his father's demise. From that moment, I lost sight of what was real. I ceased to live in a reality. Nothing was what it seemed. Words were not to be believed. Who should I trust in? And what God should I believe? How could I believe in a kingdom when a kingdom could crumble with such ease? I had no wings. No feathers. Enough with the feathers already. I could not fly. But I fled. I ran from the kingdom. The kingdom to which I had devoted my life. Many battles I had fought. So many physical wounds I endured. I was a warrior in a commit with, with, commitment with Duncan, my king, to protect and unconditionally serve. Now I, find, I found myself abandoning, abandoning his heir, Malcolm newly crowned. After the events in the castle, when I sought vengeance for my king and I ripped my broad sword through the neck of our enemy, Macbeth, I with, with pride and with victorious spirit, I swore my allegiance to Malcolm. Hail king, for so thou art. The time is free. Hail king of Scotland. My eyes became buried in tears as Malcolm spoke his inaugural speech. We will perform in measure, time and place. So thanks to all at once and to each one whom we invite to see us crowned at Scone. I am the king of the world! <laughs> I may be paraphrasing what he said. <laughs> my heart and my soul for that moment were filled with great pride only to become consumed with sorrow, grief, and selfishness. I gotta get out of here. I told Malcolm of my pending departure. I entered his chambers in the night, only a few hours before the fateful dawn of my exit from the kingdom. He sat in his bed, pleading to me, Do not leave us, Macduff. Do not leave me. Malcolm, I know our love for one another has been unspoken, but it has been tangible. And in this dimly lit room with the faint candlelight bouncing from the tears in your eyes, you make my departure so difficult. I do not mean to impede your, your journey, Macduff, but I really want to kiss you. So kiss me then and I'll be on my way. <laughs> oh my gosh, he kissed me! <laughs> our lips met, the tears on our wet faces touched and fused together as if they formed some kind of potion, an anecdote for the pain that we both endured. I have to say goodbye now, Malcolm. Forever? Perhaps. I would go with you, I know. But my kingdom... Yeah. Yes, I know you're a king. You're a big deal now. If I leave, all this, all the death, would have been for nothing. What a swell guy. Malcolm's loyalty to the kingdom intensified my passion, made me love him even more. Oh, that I could let my loyalty to the kingdom overpower my decision to depart, possibly forever. But my decision was made. Even as I exited the new king's chambers, the sound of his crying echoed into the corridor. I hesitated, turned around, thinking I could change my mind. Malcolm had already experienced such insurmountable pain. I was adding to his already crumbling weight. My, my love for him pushed me to stay, but also demanded that I leave. 
Once our lips met, there was no turning back. We could never again be in each other's presence. Farewell, Macduff. Farewell, my love. I left the kingdom, and I began the uncertain days, years, decades, and centuries of my journey. When I departed Scotland, I imagined that I would only, that I would only flee for the retaining, re remaining time of my life. I might have stayed had I remembered the span of my life would be for an eternity. Okay, so this is what happened. I know all of you are wondering, how did this guy end up living forever? I mean, aren't you just a little bit curious? <laughs> well, I'm going to tell you anyway. And don't you dare shine that light on me. Through my many travels and through the agony that is time, I, I came across many individuals that could in the present be considered historical figures. Some had done great things. Some had committed more atrocious acts that would make their legacies tainted. There were those who were persecuted and executed unjustly. She lived and died a century before I was to meet the violinist. Oh, that's the hot guy I'll tell you about later. Oh, so hot. So, the young woman was being burned at the stake. She had been captured and turned over to the English for her supposed crimes. Yeah, this is not a history lesson, it's just important to the story. I stood in the distance, hidden from the maddening crowd, and a deep sadness fell upon me once I realized that this cruel occurrence was taking place. Tied to a wooden pole, awaiting her unjust fate, her face did not display emotion. Where is your sadness? Where is your fear? She remained stoic as if, as if she accepted her punishment. She then looked in my direction. She took notice of me through the, the mob of vicious humans cheering as they anxiously awaited her impending death. So cruel. She saw me for, and she saw me for what I was. I know you. I know who you are, and I know your life. That's not possible. Is it possible we are speaking telepathically? Touche. I will show you. No, please. I beg you not to. She placed her visions into my mind. She saw what was. She saw what I lost. The murder of Duncan, my king. The slaughtering of my wife and my children. My love for Malcolm. She knew it all and she replayed it all for me. You come from magic. 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 She whispered into my brain as her eyes penetrated mine and read my soul. I had forgotten what I so long hid. My grandmother, the woman from which my, my father was born. Double, double, toil and trouble. Double, double, toil and trouble. My father had severed ties with my grandmother when I was a young boy. I had seen her incantations. Without permission, I snuck into her chamber where she chanted with her witch sisters. Not sisters by birth, but sisters bonded to her by mysticism, by the cutting of their fingers and the mixing of their boiling, almost inhuman blood. Double, double, toil and trouble, fire burning, cauldron bubble, el fuego! <laughs> Abuelita, what does that mean? It's magic, mágico. Abuelita, can I do magic? No. Ah. Pero, mijito, you have a special gift inside of you. Abuelita, can I fly? No. Ah, pero, mijito, my magic, el magico, will bring out your special gift. And sabes que? I'll be able to fly? I enough with the feathers. Sorry. Está bien, that's okay. No, no, mijito, you are going to live forever, see? I don't want to live forever, Abuelita. 
Ay, yo sé, mijito, pero you don't have a choice. Ah, doble, doble, toil and trouble, fire burning, cauldron boble, fuego. Tears then shot from my eyes as I stared at the woman on the stake. She brought back what I had forgotten, my grandmother's words. You are going to live forever. Fuego! I was brought back to El Fuego. The fire. The fire right in front of me. You must find another way to embrace your immortality. The young woman said to me as the torch was lit and she was sent to her afterlife. Whatever that was meant to be. You will tell your story, Macduff. Just tell your story. This woman named Joan had a vision that I would stand before the mortals and communicate my life and my history. I could not control my tempest of tears. Her body burned. Her life, so young, was wiped out. Did she know at that moment, however, that she would be later deemed a martyr and found worthy of sainthood? Did she know? Her life and death did seem to have a purpose. And she told the executioner, I prefer to be cooked medium well. <laughs> I laughed. She had a sense of humor. And I wondered, maybe I should have untied her. After I left Malcolm and fled Scotland so many years ago, I had been stripped of mortal limitations, but I had not been stripped of my hurtful memories. The tragedy and pain of my life lingered more intensified than before. There was no running, and as much as I ran, I would always be here. Here, Macduff would haunt me always. I traveled through many countries over the centuries, doing my best to stay alive in a world where I could not die. I most certainly never thought that I could again be drawn to a man, and my passion for Malcolm seemed a solitary occurrence. And I was proven wrong in a country called Italy, where I happened upon an abandoned castle. The melodious chants of a violin echoed through the air as I traveled through a long corridor. I was a lost immortal searching for my direction. I entered the fortress with caution and without certainty. I was looking for a map to guide me, to lead me to my destined path. I was looking for sanctuary and my purpose in a never-ending life. And I only hope that this castle, this empty castle, would show me the way. But the music, this haunting music, delighted me. My ears were held captive by their, their soothing serenade. The instrument held me in a gripping hypnosis. Its player could only be a mastermind, a genius. This virtuoso was calling to me, seducing me with the vibrant sounds of the sensational strings. And I moved down the cold corridor, the chill made more penetrating by the haunting music. And as I searched for its source, warm tears touched down upon my face, stinging me as I moved through the coolness of the air. I made my way to the end of the hallway, and I approached an open doorway, leading into darkness with only a slight flicker of light, peeking from the blackness. Insert song here. The stone entrance seemed welcoming, yet forbidding. The music swelled from the room and into my ears, and I disregarded all caution, and I moved through the opening to feel the heat of fire from a melting, glowing candle. And in that dim light, I saw the silhouette of this form. The maestro sat in the corner of the room, perched on a stool, his bow and violin in his firm grasp, and as he played, the song of strings vibrated through the room, echoing seductively, bouncing from the walls and into my soul. A shift of light revealed his face, strong and serious, focused on the masterful execution of his composition. His eyes were intense, and they dripped with streams of tears. And my eyes poured stronger than before, and he began to speak to me, but not with words. He spoke to me with his song. His music. With his instrument, he played for me his story. 
and my heart could only break in sympathy, with empathy. With the violin, he sang to me his pain and his sorrow, the loss of love and of his life. His music was not his art, it was his grief. With the world, he would not share his talents because that meant sharing his heart. Sounds familiar. He had shut himself off forever, locked within the fortress of his home, which for him had become a solitary prison. He would play forever, but he told me his music could never truly be music because no one would ever hear the sorrowful chants of the strings as they told the tale of his former world, now shattered by life's cruel blows. And the notes of his violin begged me to leave, to leave him alone in despair. And as I walked once again through the cold corridor, I grieved for the loss of an artist whose soul was stripped away by fate, whose passion passed on through sadness. And I cried because the world would never hear the beauty of his heartfelt music. The world would never hear the silent scream of his string song. The song ends. I turned around, drawn not only by his artistry, but by, but by his aroma. My more animalistic side took over, and I proceeded to join my object of my object of desire. This is the point of the play where things get a little naughty. And that evening, I opted to share a bed with the tormented and gifted musician. Can you blame me? He was totally hot. I hoped you might return, he said, allowing his violin to rest as I entered, re-entered the doorway for the chamber where he created his, his ethereal composition. He could not erase this the somberness from his visage, and he did not allow a smile to express his pleasure at my presence. But his eyes spoke to me a joy, a gladness that a union would take place between the two of us, two lost souls longing for connection. Take my hand, he whispered. He led me to his bed, and, and so began the consummation, the two of us sharing the act of love that I could not realize with Malcolm a few hundred years earlier. Malcolm was gone from this earth, but the musician was in my arms, and I did not want to leave. Stay with me, he said with a sweet sincerity. I was locked into his eyes as we lay in his bed, and I never wanted to depart. Well, was that spicy or what? In each other's embrace, we fell asleep. And what had been a beautiful evening beautiful evening of passion became a nightmare as my subconscious of my sleep took over. But death, why have you betrayed me? A vision of my wife from so many years ago appeared in the nocturnal thoughts of my brain. You told me you would never lie with another. You left me. That was not my choice, my husband. When, when my life left my body, my heart did not die. My love for you remained. I thought you would never touch, never hold someone else. I could not stop myself. Malcolm, the musician, you swayed so easily, Macduff. Did our union mean nothing to you? It meant everything. As I stared at my deceased bride, now with so much guilt in my heart, the memories I had tried to avoid for centuries now came pouring forth. I had already lost my king. What more was there to lose? And back in Scotland, enter Thane of Ross, a.k.a. the party pooper. Macduff, your castle is surprised. Your wife and babe savagely slaughtered. To relate the manner were on the quarry of these murdered deer to hold the death of you. The words ripped at me like a dagger. With the same ferocity which, with which my blade struck Macbeth's neck. What a cruel action for a man to execute for Ross to utter such a horrible report was unforgivable. I wanted to punch my hand through his chest and tear out his heart in the same manner his dispatch had destroyed mine. I, however, stood frozen in disbelief. My, my children, too? Wife, children, servants, all that could be found. All my pretty ones. Oh, did you say all? Oh, hell kite. All. All my pretty chickens and their dam in one fell swoop. 
Dispute it like a man. I shall do so. But I shall also feel it like a man. I cannot remember but such things were that were most precious to me. Did heaven look on and not take their part? Upon Macbeth's slaughter, I, I thought I had found my vengeance. A healing for my crushed heart, soul, and being. An eye for an eye did not provide my grief, the rest it so desperately needed. And as an immortal, it only intensified, and I could only push the horrific, horrific thoughts to the back of my mind until they, they reignited in my dreams. Oh, that my exit from mortality would have allowed me an absence of the need for sleep. Oh, that I would have never had another dream, another unforgiving nightmare. But unfortunately, immortality was a witch, just like my abuelita. And as I lay next to the musician, immortality put its spell on my uncontrollable hallucinations. What will you say to your children, Macduff? The woman with whom I'd been joined in matrimony now stood there in dark judgment, holding the hand of each of our children. All three of them glared at me with menacing scorn. Father, how could you denounce your love for us? One child cried. Your allegiance to us has been destroyed. The other screamed. That was not my attention. I am sorry. You are no longer our father. You are no longer my husband. Forgive me! In the dream I fell to my knees, and tears as they spoke, those words that punctured my already fragile heart. They turned my wife, my children, they turned their backs to me. And they became invisible as I grieved them once again. And I yelled without restraint as I awoke. I dragged the violinist from his peaceful slumber. He attempted to comfort and hold me tightly with his beautiful strong arms. I could not let him offer me consolation and I would not allow him to bring me contentment, regardless of what he had shared, of what we had shared that night. Allow me to love you. Allow me to heal you. The musician whispered, as he held on to me, my body resisting. He offered me tranquility. Though he seemed to know my soul, he was not aware of my immortality. He did not know that if I gave my, myself to him completely, our, our time would be limited. In his bed, he shared his story about the slaughtering of his people through religious persecution. He cried as he described the loss of his loved ones, his fellow musicians whose memory would only be translated through the strings of his violin. I cannot, I said to him coldly. If only I could speak to him with warmth. If only I could permit our union to be forever. He did not resist when I took his life. As I deprived him of his breath, he entered a hypnosis. I wanted to make his sleep as painless as possible. If I only could, I said to his lifeless form, his face, his face so beautiful and at peace. I placed his violin on his chest so that it would always be with him. He would never again play his music, but the haunting but beautiful memory of his art would always be with me. <laughs> he was so hot. <laughs> okay, you're probably wondering, what did you do, Macduff? You took his life? Hey, don't judge me. It was the 1500s. Those were the times. The truth is, I could have fallen in love with him. And I knew that he would die someday die, and I would just go on living. I just thought it would be easier. And so that's my life. They all die, and I am meant to live. I would like to think that my life has some sense of purpose. 
There had to be a reason why my grandmother placed her magical spell on me and left me a prisoner on this planet for infinity. Even she died. That's not fair. And you know what? I I'm up here trying to share my story, and you could care less. I thought I could somehow make my existence bearable by trying to connect with you, by trying to manipulate a laugh or two, maybe induce a few boo-hoos from the audience. But it doesn't matter. I I'm tired. I'm tired of pretending that I belong here, that I am relevant because I have 452 friends on Facebook. <laughs> That's one less than yesterday. And I have no idea what happened to that other person. Did they drop me as a friend? Did they tire me of my endless videos of me singing? I can't sing, I know that. But what's wrong with doing something that I enjoy to bring a speck, a speck of joy into my never-ending, torturous life? I enjoy singing show tunes. That's my secret. Best invention ever. If we had them in Scotland 1,000 years ago, maybe I wouldn't have been so moody all the time. Or did that Facebook person just take a break from Facebook? Ugh. I'm so exhausted with social media, I just need some time off. But you know they're still there. They didn't take a break, they're invisible. They're still spying on their friends, stalking their past lovers. It's the fear of missing out. FOMO! <laughs> we all have it. Even me, I'm so absent from this world, yet somehow I cannot not be a part of it. Being immortal makes me really sad. But if I was no longer immortal, I would be really, really sad as well. I can't figure that one out. Go ahead and shine that light on me. I'm done. And so continues the never-ending journey of Macduff. And, and thank you. I'm stepping off the stage now. Hey, oh, wait, Macduff? Zacharu, what are you doing here? I wanted to see you perform. How, how did you... Well, I, I did. I mean, I came here for the coffee, and there you were. I, I really enjoyed your performance. Performance? Just a bunch of rambling nonsense. Well, I, I liked it. Especially the part about me. Is all of that true? It's only true if you believe it. Well, I believe you believe it. You make me sound insane. Who well, aren't we all? Look, um, Zacharu. I appreciate your kind words, and you seem really nice, but I can't. You can call me Zachary instead if you want. And that was it. I failed at yet another chance of love. Zacharu deserves so much better. Zacharu, by the way, make sure you tip your barista on the way out. <laughs> Living in a pandemic. Having spent a week in my apartment without electricity during a winter freeze, shivering and hoping death would bring me release from the unbearable temperatures, and then I remembered, oh right, I'm immortal. Crap. It is during those times of trial that having a hand to hold would be paradise. But having to depend on someone only to lose someone, that's too much. I'd rather be alone. Even forever. Don't be alone, Macduff. I'm a ghost. Ooh. <laughs> Don't run, Macduff. You're always running. Oh, that's why I'm in such great shape. Life is too short, Macduff. Or in your case, too long? You're funny. Malcolm, will you marry me? Oh, if I could. Malcolm, this world scares me. You're Macduff. You're brave. You're a warrior. When I passed away so many years ago, I, I died in battle. But I faced my death with courage. And as I took my last breath, it, it was your name I whispered, Macduff. I was inspired by you, your loyalty, your strength, your perseverance. Do not be afraid, my love. Face this world and live in it. When we risk lo loss, we increase our chance for gain. Live, Macduff. Live. Malcolm, don't leave me. I never left. But don't leave yourself. 
Fly, Macduff. Fly. I have no feathers. <sighs> Macduff, enough of the feathers. Did you want to see that? A ghost. <laughs> so continues the journey of Macduff. 2021, the year of Macduff. <laughs> okay, for real, I'm, I'm stepping off the stage. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thank you so much uh, for being an audience. And in terms of time, what I'm planning to do for the, the next phase of this script, uh, at, when it eventually becomes on, uh, a stage production or a workshop on stage, is to add some songs and some staging that'll kind of expand the time. It's supposed to be like about an hour show. So they'll shorten that script-wise with the reading. But there's a lot of things that are kind of added that aren't like actually in the reading of the script. But I thank you so much for uh, wanting to be part of this and for being a good audience. and. Uh, for being such an attentive and wonderful audience, I appreciate that. So I think we'll start with those in the audience. Um, and if those of y'all out there want to kind of guide me in any other ways beyond that, we can do that. Um, so um, if you have any thoughts or just kind of feedback about the play, what I'm really looking at is not really in terms of like the actual performance aspect of it, but just in the reading and hearing the play, how it flowed, uh, you know, the story, the characters, what maybe didn't make sense, if you have some questions of things that were unclear, we were happy to kind of have a little discussion with the time that we have, so um, feel free. So. And then if we don't have questions from the audience, we can of course see if there's any questions uh, in the comments in the live stream. Yes? Hi. Uh, good show. Thank you. Thank you. I enjoyed it. A um, uh, couple of comments. Uh, doing any kind of my... I have a theory, or I have an opinion. Uh, anytime you do a derivative of another work, mm -hmm. it's um, it's a balancing act of how much to include of the original, so people that didn't see it uh, will understand, but not to do too much. And you know, so it's oh, so it's too much. So good on that. Uh, uh, when you when you threw in Joan of Arc, and then we're going to another musician, I was afraid it would turn into Forrest Gump and there'd be just a lot of uh, historical figures thrown in. So I'm, I'm, I'm glad of that, but that kept me uh, distracted a little bit. Um, you, you said, uh, this is gonna be, I'm, I'm gonna go long. Um, no, that's fine, you, you, you said anecdote when you meant antidote. antidote. What? You said anti an anecdote when you meant antidote. Thank you for correcting that. And, <laughs> and I, I think when I said it, I was like, oh, I said the wrong <laughs> word. <laughs> I'm sure you see it on the reading. Um, uh, what? Uh, and something else. I liked how the story flowed um, from uh, at, at the beginning of any show, the show tells you what it's going to be. And you did that well by starting with your voice and then being your inner voice of your voice to let us know where we were and what was going on. So uh, that was good. And uh, uh, I really felt the different characters as you were portraying them, uh, Mc, uh, Malcolm and, and everybody. So uh, good, good stuff there. Well, thank you for that feedback and um, yeah there was definitely a, a challenge for me in tackling again something that was from you know a, a classic work uh, but again it was a, a play and a character that was so kind of intrigued me and in wondering like what his life was in dealing with kind of the memories the demons and just himself after the play is over so I think, you know, I've, done, I've directed Shakespeare, I've acted Shakespeare, and I've kind of encountered a lot of critics of what Shakespeare should be, you know, and how you should tackle Shakespeare's characters and such. So I wanted to be very respectful, but again, kind of put the, the character in another context. So I really appreciate that feedback of trying to find that balance, and that's something that I was really struggling with. Was I, gonna just, I didn't want to, like, just, you know, do a Cliff Notes version of the play and then, and then start my play. So um, I, I'm still working on that and just finding that right balance of, giving the context to those who might not know the play, um, but still not overuse 
references to the original, you know, classic work. So, and then, um, oh, go ahead. And I have one other thing to comment and, on. Um, thoughts, but. The using using the the year two thousand and it's kind of twenty years old. You know, m most people are now saying twenty twenty one. It's it's just left over from the uh, space odyssey. So gotcha. Yeah. That's a good thing. Feedback. Like what? What year was it during Mac, uh, You know, during Macbeth was it? Yeah, ten something. Um, yeah, it was about ten sixty six AD. That's right. just a, that's something that comes to my that's, mind for some reason. You know, that's minor. No, no, no. That's a great feedback. And again, it's just you know from the sound of the audience and how they hear and how they relate to how things are actually said now, as opposed to like you said, maybe like ten years ago or something like that. Yeah, and you yeah, you so. you did uh, making making things current with the the current stuff. All all good. Yeah, and a few years ago, and you, it's, I'm glad you brought that up about just having like the, the not overusing uh, historical figures in the story. I think that's what is originally going to be kind of like a, a Bill and Ted's journey through the past, you know, and, and encountering all these historical figures and how he adapts to the time frame that he's in. But I really wanted to kind of put him in the present and show him adapting to 2021 and, you know, still reflecting on his past and his memories. But I didn't want it to be just kind of like, you know, uh, the, the time machine or just some kind of journey that was just, you know, adding historical figures like Forrest Gump for the sake of adding historical figures, which is a great movie, by the way, but, you know, I didn't want to copy that concept, but thank you. Yes. Uh, my name is Sheila, and Hi, Sheila. I enjoyed the presentation very much. Um, you. Your process, your creative process, how did you, I mean, you, you put voice into it, definitely, I mean, literally and figuratively, but uh, how much rewriting did did you do, or how much did you play around with verb tenses? And I mean, I've been reading things recently that it's all in the present tense, but somehow or other they managed to convey something that happened, you know, 30 years. And so I say to him, instead of I said to him. Um, yeah, that's a good question. I think that's something, uh, I think all the kind of grammatical questions in terms of tense, uh, I'm still, I, I, I need to tackle the script in that respect. But I, I, I've been working on this for a few years, and it was there was kind of like another version of this sure. that I kind of kind of put aside and really wanted to kind of tackle it from scratch this year. Particularly when we did that first reading back in August, and since then I've been working on primarily the story, the structure, you know, and what was important in terms of telling his story, particularly telling his story now, in, you know, in current times, you know, as opposed to again just taking another time travel journey, but. Um, I'll be honest, in terms of that work, I think that's a lot of work I still need to look at. And I'm glad you brought that to my attention because I am a writer and I write like, you know, short novels and poetry and everything. So I do kind of pay attention to that kind of thing. But uh, I think I've kind of let that go for this just so I can kind of, uh, how do you say it, kind of do kind of a stream of consciousness and let the voice of the character come out. And I think I still need to work on that. But, but I think that would probably be the next phase is kind of figuring out the technical stuff. Yeah. Well, and one more thing. I, yes. uh, I see it on stage, and I know you said that's not what we're talking about, but I see you on stage actually making eye contact more with the audience, like when you're saying, you know, okay, he was really hot, and, you know, ha hand that a little bit more, and, you know, move your head and make eye contact, because I think that's the humor and the whole, uh, the humanity and the humor combined, so. Yeah, and that's, that's very important to me, is to kind of, like you said, I think that's key, is making and bringing out his humanity, and and having the audience kind of relate to him, understand him, be empathetic, and say he's a he's a, just a normal guy like the rest of us, you know. Uh, I think, and I actually did underline those kind of lines mm -hmm. just to remind myself those have importance because that's where he breaks out of like the Macduff character and becomes just like yeah. the human guy who has a crush on you know a violin minister. And maybe a little bit more of like louder, softer, louder, softer gives a lot of drama to it too. Like if you're looking down, you know, make it softer, and if you're looking up. Make it louder. I mean, I'm not a director, but that's no. Those I'd are like great. You to that's fool great feedback. When you start. <laughs> and I think in the reading, uh, I'm a person who's uh, I get a little nervous when I'm reading. <laughs> you know, so I think that you know, I think I might have kind of rushed and kind of just jumped over those moments where I could have done that. I more, have so. some some friends and I have been talking about it that you know I live alone. Plus, the more alone uh, with the uh, COVID shit and. Um, I'm not as articulate as I was two years ago. It's partly my age, I'm sure, but uh, 
you know, I just started talking out loud, even alone, and my cat's sort of like, uh huh. Uh, but I, I would, I stumble over words a lot more than I used to reading out loud, even so. I know. I thought you did great on it all. Well, I appreciate considered. it. And, and the, the, the nine, I think what I wanted to do in terms of giving more humanity was kind of change the dynamic of the play in terms of who is he talking to. And I'll be honest, the last reading, I didn't know as, a, as the writer, as the actor, who am I talking to. So I tried to give this more clarity. And, you know, I've done enough of these. I've done some stand-up comedy. I've done various, like, open mics, you know, around town. And, you know, I know what it is to, like, sign up and, and, and just uh, feel that, like, what, what do I want to use? I have five minutes. What am I going to do with it? And again, it, it becomes like telling his whole life story and journey, which is like centuries long, you know. So I think it really started to click for me. And I'm still working on it. Again, work in progress. But I think that aspect allowed him to be more human and be more vulnerable as opposed to before. I think the script was just, I think, me trying to show off, like, this is how much I know about Macduff and the Shakespeare play and stuff like that. So uh, it had to give it more purpose. Yeah, so... Thank you for those comments. Did you have anything you wanted to add? And if you also have yeah, some other thoughts. I was going to ask, that, so one of the things I, I, I came around to figure out, but I never quite felt the, the, the reason that he was on stage. Yeah. You know, I mean, was he on the top? Was it a coffee shop? Was it a, a one-man tour? Or was it a, you know, I, I never quite understood what, what pulled him up on stage. Or, you know, was it a improv or, or something? Yeah, and, and I, I should have made that more clear. I did make the reference, but maybe too late, where uh, Zacharu was there getting some coffee. So I tried yeah. to at least create the atmosphere that it was like a coffee shop. That's why I was wondering if it was supposed to be a coffee shop, because that came in like way at the end. It was too far into the show. Into, yeah. But yeah, it's like one of those typical open mics that they have at the coffee shops all over Austin. Yeah. Um, yeah, and him just trying to, I think, take the lead from what Joan of Arc told him, you know, tell your story. So here he is, you know, trying to just sign up and... I think he's made several attempts, but he just can't quite open up. <laughs> and now he's opening up too much, you know. Yeah. So it's like, and obviously, yeah. you're just doing a reading, so you don't yeah. have any stage setting or dressing or anything that might help explain it as well. Uh, the other question was: um, Are you looking at this as being a one-man show, or are you looking at this being more uh, two people or more of a larger cast? Or? You know, I've, I've actually given that thought. I mean, I, I do a lot of, you know, of course, a lot of solo shows over the years, and that's become kind of what I do in terms of how I kind of express myself artistically. Uh, but I also write plays for, like, multicasts, you know. Uh, but I think this one, I think it's it's kind of, like, more internalized and personal to me that I want to keep it as a solo show. But that, that being the case, you know, I, I can envision later on so in the last reading, we had some, uh, some people kind of suggest, well, maybe you could do like, you know, audio voiceovers, things like that, people, and he's responding to people's voices, things like that. Or, you know, in some solo shows, you do have like actors who are just kind of like incidental, maybe in the background, and he's reacting to them, but they're not necessarily speaking, so. Um, I saw it as a two-person show. I, I mean, being McDuff and then another person playing all the, the other cast, where you're kind of going in and out of over his kind of problem playing this Yeah, I mean, that would be very a fun and interesting take because, um, and I've written like two-person shows before, and I did like, uh, I, I used to do a lot of touring in elementary schools here in Austin with various theater companies, and um, an actress and myself, we did a two-person version of Lying the Witch in the Wardrobe, and just the interesting dynamic of how you have to kind of, I think it's more, I, it's, it's actually scarier because you just have that other person and they're depending on you, you're depending on them. With me, I can kind of wing it and it's okay, but with another person on stage, uh, sometimes you can't always take those risks and wing it as much as you would like to. And of course, in improv, you can do that kind of thing, but that's, that's interesting and I would, I would be interested to see how another person would play those characters and how my character as the central kind of focus of the story reacts to them. So. That's not, out of the, that's not out of the question, so that's something I would think about and consider as, as I move forward. As a set director, you know, Shakespeare's very big on ghosts, and so some kind of a cutout or something to just suggest that might be kind of interesting. Yeah, and I thought about one. that too. I, I can envision it, I can't exactly. And, you know, it. the use of props, I love props, and, you know, some shows I use props, some I don't. This one I think would be kind of, not prop heavy, but the props could be other characters, you know. I or imagine him having like... Maybe he comes on stage with a trunk, you know, like in the old vaudeville style, you know. Or projections. Projections, too. Yeah, so. Um, but those are great possibilities, and, and I think I try to stay open-minded because I, I, I like, I never say never, but 
one thing I would like, I've done, I've done a lot of my shows a lot really bare bones, because since it's just me on stage, I just like to be a storyteller, but I would really like to explore maybe doing more technical stuff mm -hmm. to kind of add to the show. So very good feedback. Thank you. Um, when might we see the show? Um, who knows? Um, we'll see how, you know, this year, last year and this year have been challenging for all the leaders here in Austin. And uh, the last major show that I've done in front of, like on a stage was last year, last Christmas, I did a, I do a, a one-man show every Christmas time called Abuelita's Christmas Carol. And I actually kind of pulled from the Abuelita character and put it into this. And I'm going to ask you all about that, actually. Um, and we did that live stream from the ground floor theater, so we didn't actually have an audience. And now that we're actually able to have people in the audiences, I guess we'll see how 2022 goes. 2022? <laughs> I lost count of where we are. <laughs> um, and uh, see how we can get this up on its feet and have an audience. and. Uh, so hopefully sooner than later, you know, so I think I still have some work to do, but I think with every reading that I do and all the feedback I get, it, it, it gets me more excited about, you know, making it happen and bringing it to fruition for an audience. So. I want to share some stuff from the YouTube. Oh, great. I think we have some comments. Yeah, yeah. Um, Eva says, Felicidades. Evan Quaid. Oh, hey. Um, your friend Jake, Jake oh, yeah. says, uh, he, he was actually in alignment with this gentleman right here about mentioning the open mic and considering a, a second actor. So that's funny that y'all are just like in alignment. This is, the stream actually runs about 20 or 30 seconds behind. So like, he did not know like what he was saying. He was typing this up. I'm, I'm hearing this in real time going, wow, this guy looks like it. Y'all are sharing. And I actually so knew that know. he might have those, that kind of thought. <laughs> <laughs> he really wants me to have other people on stage. Oh, that's <laughs> okay. funny. Um, And I, and I do feel like I kind of left, maybe he felt the completion, but I don't think the audience necessarily does. And, you know, it's been interesting, you know, since last year, uh, as we've kind of kind of gone a little bit into isolation with COVID and everything, I felt this kind of sense of urgency. It's funny because I had been taking kind of a break a couple of years, doing some shows, but not really doing a lot of theater. And I hadn't been using my time well in terms of getting out there and putting myself out there with my plays and such and performing um, as much as I used to in years before that. And once the pandemic hit, I was like, oh my gosh, you know, I felt like I was running out of time. I have to do things. And so like, you know, I, I was constantly on Zoom doing play readings with friends. I was doing online open mics. I was doing, you know, kind of doing whatever I could to kind of put my work out there in the world. And so I felt like, oh, I have to do this. Not before it's too late, but it just made me sense Think, you know we have to think about now and it's you know we can't like gamble on tomorrow we have to live for today and I think that's kind of what I was using to propel Macduff but the, but the, the problem is he's he's immortal so he, he doesn't necessarily feel the the urgency and that lack of time that I feel but there is something that has to press him to want to get on stage and tell a story like you said so I'm definitely gonna try to figure that out so. yeah that like instigating yeah. thing and maybe it's something to do with like Zachary uh, Jack wanted to make sure that uh, that he was talking about the other actor on stage just being Zachary. Like, maybe if Zachary is real, then it makes everything real. I'm kind of in between. I'm kind of in between, like, Eva's feeling and Jake's feeling. Uh -huh. Like, uh, 
maybe some kind of shadow puppetry where you're like the only real person we see on stage, but perhaps there are people behind the scenes live making shadow puppetry or something like these other characters that help like enhance the story. Uh, because I do think like having some other element there for you to interact with would be great. But then again, like perhaps that really is just props for you. Like yeah. Stands into Zachary, or like, you know what I mean? <laughs> well, yeah, and I've also I've also thought about like puppetry, and I'm not very skilled in that kind of thing. But I have, you know, I've taught middle school and high school, and I've taught a little bit of shadow puppetry, and that would be great, you know, and, and finding you know people who would kind of join my team to be able to do that behind the scenes, and um, or even find ways where I could do that on my own as well, you know, or even if it's kind of projection type thing, you know, something that's pre-recorded or filmed or something. Or an actually film clip without sound would be kind yeah, of, you know, so. especially that kind of just, you know, flops around a little bit. Yeah, and, and something that he yeah. sees and reacts and to. And so that's like, from your brain. Yeah. There's a lot to, a lot that could be done with this. Yeah, yeah, so I love the, yeah, those possibilities. You know, I, I, I'll be honest, I, I, I'm leaning towards a solo type show, but I'm keeping my mind open towards the additional. Like, you know. I was like, ooh, I love that puppet. <laughs> hey, I was sorry, I puppets, but again, I'm just not like technically skilled. So, oh, that's why you get like collaborators. You know? Yeah, and I know plenty of people who like can build and do puppetry and you know good tech people. So, yeah. Eva, I'm sorry I missed your show last week. <laughs> so, was there a reason why you, you know, your your kind of your historic, two historic characters? And I know I, I agree that you don't want to. Course, dump it, but you kind of, you know, you, you, you got up to like, what, the 15th century? Is where the musician yeah, was? Yeah, the 15th century, I think in the 1500s, and then I guess the Joan of Arc was around the 1400s, if I'm not yeah. mistaken. And, so. and then you, you make the jump up to now. Yeah. Uh, and I don't know if there's, you know, with the timing that you're trying to hit, it may not be worth be a uh, another character in there that's, of, you know, the 60s, 70s, or even. Two, week, two weeks ago, which I guess could be a motivation for wanting to do the, the coffee shop deal, but maybe instead of the 15th century, have the musician be a little bit more recent, so that you you have something that you can the audience can relate to. That you know you, your character it gives your character the reason for wanting to unload all of this. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I just uh, I like that. I, I guess I was I was entranced by uh, the violin care the violinist, and I just felt like that that time period, particularly the violin was invented around the fifteen hundreds. So I thought it made it so much more romantic. But there's no reason why it couldn't be this, this have had the same well, kind of I mean, I romance. The, actual, the, the castle and the, the picture that you paint with yeah. with that as well. I'm just you know one of the things I think the, the story kind of struggles with is. What led, what led, what leads Macduff to get on stage? Yeah. Why after millennia does he suddenly <laughs> feel the need to to get in front of an audience and tell a story? Yeah, I did have like a section that I cut. It was just a very brief section where I cut out where he talks about encountering James Dean and they had like a little thing <laughs> and, uh, cause, and it, it just seemed kind of not in place. It didn't have a purpose. But I get what you're saying. I think what propels him again that purpose and that arc of just like. What does he want, and what is he trying to accomplish, and why does he ultimately get on that stage? And yeah. you know, it has to be more than just why does he wait five hundred years after Joan of Arc gives him the advice to take it? You know, so yeah, it's just, what is the trigger for, for doing it? Exactly. Do you have a chance? I think I think what could answer that question in a way is maybe that we live in the culture of fame, right? There's TikTok, there's everything that you just put out, and it's just kind of now, right? I mean, we've had YouTube and Facebook where you tell your story, but now it's even more so. And so you maybe make up wants to fill that loneliness in some way by telling a story and getting out there and he, you know, it's just a way to no one will ever understand. Who knows if they'll believe me, but that's why you've waited so long because now it's just so easy. And the advice finally got to Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah, definitely. And I, I want to have a little bit of something to incite that and uh, without kind of being too, not making it too much a device at the beginning is like, you know, oh, he is, he reads like, you know, uh, maybe he, yeah, he sees like a video or something, it's something. It's just the culture of it. 
Yeah. Now, 2021, well known, but if you point out somewhere, sure. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, and I did want to bring you a little bit more of. A, I'm not a big, honestly, a social media person other than like Facebook. But I think if, if I want to make him more relevant to the times, I got to maybe bring that a little bit more into play. So. I. I mean, I have. Shadows are just very, like sh the use of shadow puppets kind of brings kind of almost like a darkness, and they're kind of you know there's no faces, so it is kind of yeah. bleak in a sense. Yeah, I like just the human form of a, of a shadow. Yeah. Kind of yeah. Appreciate that. Uh, Jake says Macduff is immortal. The pandemic is a lot of death. That could move a man thinking about the preciousness of life. Huh? Yeah, that's great. Uh, nicely worded. Um, yeah, and I, and I think maybe it's forcing him to to want to connect to the world a little bit more, you know, than he used to. You know, he's been able to kind of get by because I think as he went through from century to century, I mean, death was kind of a more common thing. You know, you know, there was plagues and you know, bat wars, and he saw it all, and he was kind of numb to it because he'd been through it all already. And but when he lived, started living a more contemporary civilization where people it's not so common, you know, and people cling more to their lives and, you know, becoming part of the world. I think he was kind of, he was started to kind of break the, the walls a little bit, especially during COVID where he just saw it happen in mass numbers, you know, so. We see more of everyone's lives today, so it's, oh, that's what life is, well then here's mine, so I think that's great. Yeah, and then again, seeing everybody on social media, you know, expressing themselves, yeah. So do you think the Duff would be, I mean, Somebody who had lived all this time, saw the Black Plague, saw all kinds of war and poverty. I, I get the impression that if I were that old and I saw all that, and then I saw how we all reacted to COVID, I, I would probably just die laughing. <laughs> it's, it's, I mean, somebody who, who, you know, saw just people whose lifespans were just a handful of decades. Yeah. And then he sees everybody just going all ballistic on COVID, which, dangerous as it is, compared to what he's seen, it's nothing. And I'm wondering if if a lot of Macduff's story is him having to move past being kind of the old curmudgeon kind of person <laughs> and having to embrace technology culture. Yeah. And maybe he is, I, I mean, I'm, I'm like you, you you've, you've seen my uh, ability uh, <laughs> to be on Facebook, and that's Facebook, I don't even get bothered with the other stuff, but, you know, maybe a lot of what his story is, is him realizing he does have to embrace the culture and technology and put himself out there. Yeah. I, I don't know, I, I just, I, I, I'm a little leery of putting too much of COVID and pandemic into the story because I think it dates things too much. And I, I actually think, thought of that too. I mean, it, I, I think, uh, which gives me a little bit more urgency in terms of like putting this on stage at some point. But, uh, but yeah, I think, you know, trying to be in sync with what everybody else is experiencing in, in terms of the COVID, but particularly with like the world 
culture, technology, things like that. And, yeah, I just think know. that, you know, because these things take time to develop, that by the time, you know, you, you get this to a point where it becomes a more full-on one-man show or two-man show or radio show, podcast, whatever it's yeah. going to end up being, um, like you know, by that point, you know, we'll move on beyond pandemic, you yeah. know, to other things. So I think you have to be kind of careful about, you know, making, making a, a show that obviously I think is timeless, too tied to a time period where it becomes just old news and people are tired of that. No, I totally get that, you know, and uh, so I think I, I just have to kind of figure out the backdrop of like, what is his true struggle? What does he want? Mm -hmm. Ultimately, at the end of the play, does it have to do with like living with a society that's dealing with COVID, or is it really just about trying to live in the 21st century? You know, so overall, but, but those are good things to think about. As I again continue to revise, so I appreciate. It. One last nugget that this conversation is like bringing up for me: um, Jonathan Frakes is like maybe the concept of footprints. We talk a lot about the feather and not being able to float and not being able to just breeze through anything or fly away. So for me, McDuff is very anchored to the earth. He has to walk every step in his life anchored to the ground. What do you what do you leave behind? What do you touch along the way? And in this new world that you find yourself in, what like digital footprints are you now leaving behind? can't, in this like modern technology world, you can't hide anymore, mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're, you're going to be captured by cameras, and you're going to have a Facebook account, and what happens 50 years from now when McDuff is still the same person he was 50 years ago online? I never thought of that, wow. Yeah, so <laughs> I mean, if, if, if you want to imagine like a future time so that you're not so much stuck in 2021, like, you know, these like little breadcrumbs or nuggets or footprints or whatever, maybe just ex exploring that theme. Even if you don't change any of the script, just like thinking about it. No, that, that's some great insight. And uh, again, be, him being immortal is like, that's kind of key almost to like his journey. <laughs> it's like the, not only the past, the past and the present, but the future, you know, so. And uh, how is he going to deal with that? And how has he dealt with it? I love, I mean, I love, I, I'm fascinated with the idea of, uh, this could be like a streaming series called Macduff, like on Netflix or Hulu. And we kind of actually see him go from century to century. And how does his character change and adapt? And what, what does he leave behind? I think that's a great question. So yeah, um, and, I'll and explore that. You because know. he is immortal and in lots of ways, he's timeless. I mean, yeah. nothing has to be linear. Like you jump back and forth a lot in the script as it is, yeah. which I think is a, a feature of this particular piece. Like I like that it's not linear. Yeah, I really wanted to move away from, we had actually talked about that yeah. originally, you know, so the linear uh, construction. Did y'all have like another question? Uh, yeah, so for immortals, uh, just every 50 years or so, you leave something to your long lost nephew and you change your hairstyle. That's easy fix. Um, but I was going to say, if Macduff was in, in the middle of court intrigue with Macbeth and uh, Malcolm and everybody, what other wars have gone on? What does he think about all the palace coups, all the wars that have happened in the, you know, in the intervening centuries? Uh, there's always a war, and is could there be some comment on that? Yeah, uh, and that intrigued me a little bit too. It's just kind of his history, at being immortal, but yet having the limitations of a mortal. How how was he able to travel, and where did where did he go? What did he see? How did he eventually end up in Austin, Texas? You know, so but that's that's a, that's kind of a you know I'm sure he spent a lot of time in Europe. You know, so what did he see in those decades and centuries that followed? Yeah, war like, is, he, wars, is he avoiding like, war? Is he yeah. trying to get uh, ahead of it, or you know what? And it's, it's uh, just, I, mean, I, wanted to, I kind of wanted to explore that he is a warrior. He's trained for battle. You know, he's brave, like 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 Malcolm tells him. You know. But does he? How does he leave all that behind? And how will he be ever, ever be able to? Maybe that's part of what his journey is: trying to recapture what he used to be, but not being so savage, being more civilized in the 21st century. You know. But how can he apply what he was to the times now? Maybe that's something I can explore also. But what he went through is yeah. just so traumatic. He's never going to lose it. Yeah. So. 
person's character. Thousands of years don't matter. Yeah, exactly. So, did we have anything else on YouTube or the comment section? Uh, no, Jake had to head out. He says good night and great work. <laughs> Thanks, Jake. Yeah. Well, thanks, Dave. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay. Well, this has been very helpful, and um, we'll have this available for me to watch so I can go back and, and, and listen to your comments again as I'm reworking this. So, um, keep your eyes out, you know, see what 2022 brings. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm not doing anything. I was going to see if I'm doing anything in Austin. I'm at my Abolitas Christmas Carol, I decided to do that in Corpus Christi. Uh, my family lives down that area. I, I, I periodically performed it kind of all over South Texas and Central Texas, but this year I chose Corpus Christi and uh, I did it in Austin as a live stream last year. So, but uh, where just in Corpus? Where? at the you know where the Aurora Arts Theater is? Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. I know where that is. So, that's I think December 18th and 19th, which is a Saturday and Sunday. So, you were going to ask us about what we thought about Abuelita. Oh, yeah, so. I, I, I did that. I wrote Abuelita's Christmas Carol as a tribute to my grandmother, and uh, so that character is kind of inspired by her. So I, I, I didn't want to, like, I wasn't necessarily putting my grandmother character into this play, but I, I kind of wanted to add a little absurdity. So I thought, you know, Macduff is from Scotland, why not <laughs> make it a little silly? And he, he has a Mexican American grandmother, and he himself, you know, and, and she, she goes from grandmother to being Abuelita. And I just thought it was just kind of a. A, kind of a, a funny thing for, to, for for myself, I think, you know, to give it a little bit of humor and levity and absurdity, and then kind of move back into the seriousness of, of the the spell and the, the magic and all that, you know, as we connect with Joan of Arc and all that. So works for me. Yeah. And uh, but I might find another way to play that character, so it's not so uh, so much of a caricature, and maybe it's still kind of more. She's still a little bit mysterious, kind of a sorceress, you know, like the witches. In the play, the Shakespeare play, I want to make it still make her a little dark somehow, you know. So, but I like the idea of the fuego, the fire, you know, and then attaching that to Joan of Arc and the fate that she met. So, um, I kind of like the way that worked out. So. Oh, so what's the name of the play that this play is based on? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not that superstitious. But I'm very, I'm very respectful of other people's kind of like thoughts on that. I usually try to only say it within the context of a play. <laughs> but, uh, Just checking. So I'll say like Shakespeare's play or the Scottish play, but I'm not as maybe superstitious as I, I should be as a theater person, but but I still try to respect it. So, um, but thank you. Um, well, thank you all for being here, and uh, uh, again, keep your eyes open, and uh, hopefully, you know, we'll see this on stage in uh, another version, and. Uh, and also keep an eye out for any other works I'll be doing next year in Austin. So thank you very much. Thank you. Have a good one. It's great to be here. I haven't performed at the Vortex like in about almost 15 years, I think. <laughs> wow. I was on time that day. <laughs> I thought that was you. <laughs> you didn't say anything. <laughs> What could I say? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny, I was going to text you earlier today.